thank you all for coming. And we want in particular, um, we're honored and pleased to have our old friend Warren Farrell join us. And Emphasis on the old, I guess. <laughs> uh, correct. Um, and we want to try sort of a mixture of formats in all this. One is uh, convey some information about Warren's uh, most recent book, um, White Men Earn More. And then there's a long subtitle that has things like the startling truth behind the pay gap and what women can do about it, um, which is good to know for those of you who are women. Uh, there's a lot of myths, a lot of misunderstandings on both sides of the street. And one of the things I think that the past 20 or 30 years have shown us in almost any type of interpersonal human relationship is the more you can take the perspective of the other, the more both of you grow. And increasingly, what we found in the past decade or two is that if you start with what looks to be any sort of differentiation, masculine and feminine, those who have power, those who don't, those who are bosses, those who are workers, it, it, it often looks, if you're one type and there is another type, that this other type that you envy has all the power or all the goods or all the fun. And in some cases, that's true. But when you actually get a chance to take the role of other, actually play that, or actually get that role, then you start to realize it's just its own unending nightmare in its own way. And we saw this particularly role reversals with men and women, starting from the 50s when basically men were the producers and went to work and women stayed home and had kids and so on. Both sides of that particular stereotypical situation thought the other side had it made. So men had the power, and a lot of women had the idea that what happens there is you go to work, and you have secretaries, and you boss people around, you have a whole lot of fun, you get a whole lot of money. You're probably boinking your secretary on the side. <laughs> and all of that you get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for. And you get three martinis for lunch, and a private jet, and so fun, fun, fun. <laughs> and the man's version of what the wife was doing was staying home and, and sucking Cool Whip out of a can and watching as the world turns. <laughs> and that even if they had a couple of kids, her job basically was, if he got home and the kids were alive, she'd done her job. <laughs> and how much work could that take? <laughs> so... <laughs> As one of the great things of the 60s and 70s, now, not to belittle it, there, are, there is oppression. There's this horrible marginalization and so on. But it turns out to be much more complex than both sides thought. And what we've seen over the past 20 or 30 years is in addition to trying to deal with the truly objective components of this, there was a chance for role reversal. Women did get a chance to go in and become the CEO and the president. And men did stay home and raise kids and so on. And both of them found that these jobs were not the easy, laid-back, fun thing they thought. It was its own variety of hell. And so what's interesting right now is we seem to be getting to a position where, at least to some degrees, both men and women have much more choices than they did in terms of taking these different roles. And the more you look at both sides, the more incredibly complex and interesting and fascinating it becomes. So with that, let me uh, first, if we just all give a round of welcome to. <laughs> and then maybe for uh, a few minutes, you could focus on the recent book. Tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. what it's about. Maybe mm -hmm. it's Genesis, some of its conclusions, mm -hmm. and how you see mm -hmm. it moving forward. Yeah. Since you failed miserably in your run for governor of California. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you all know this, but he ran for the governor of California. He was indeed officially on the ballot. And um, all of his relatives and close friends voted for him. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and start with the book itself and some of its... Yeah, uh, let's see. I guess this book really emanated from when I was back... On the, I used to be on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women, at, Women in New York City and was doing... Uh, was war, do you, how many of you are old enough to remember or read history books enough to know that there used to be a 59-cent pin that we would wear 
Do you, anybody, reckon, raise your hand if you remember the 59 cent pin. It was, the 59 cent pin was what? It, it represented the belief that men earn a dollar for each 59 cents that women earned. And I was part of um, protesting that discrimination that I assumed was what accounted for the difference between 59 cents and a dollar and um, was very involved in that activity. And one day I asked myself the question, one day is sort of a brief version of the truth. Uh, one day I sort of asked myself the question, if men earn a dollar for each 59 cents that women earn for the same work, why would, ever, why would anyone ever hire a man to do anything? <laughs> <laughs> and that you know, if they did hire a man to do anything, I mean, sooner or later a woman or somebody even another man had to discover that if you, you could get women to do these things for 59 cents, you could produce your product for 59 cents and put anybody out of business who was producing it for a dollar. So something seemed a little bit suspicious about that. Um, and so I started looking more carefully into the, to the data. And I started finding, some of you will remember from the old days, a woman named Jessie Bernard, uh, who wrote the book, uh, a book on family. And, I saw in the appendix of that book that never married women earned more than never married men. This is back in the 70s. And I'm thinking, what? And so I kept, started investigating that data. And I found that you know, since then, it was true that never, not never married women earned more than never married men, but that never married women who had never had children earned more than never married men who had never had children. Um, so that just by itself was just sort of like woke me up. And now it's never married, the most recent data is never married women who never had children now earn 116% of what never married men who never had children earn. But now some of my feminist friends said to me, well, Warren, the reason that that's probably true, if it's true, is that the never married men basically are losers. That's why women don't marry them. <laughs> And never married women are winners, which is why they don't get married. <laughs> and if you subtract out the loser word and just subject and, and, and substitute for loser um, less education, fewer hours worked, and substitute for winner more education and more hours worked, there's actually some truth to that. So what I needed to do was to um, control for income and control for education. And actually this piece of data that I gave you a moment ago was, was when income and education are controlled for, that's when never married women earn 116% more than never married men. When they're not controlled for, the gap is greater. Um, but, the, uh, but there was a, a germ of truth to what my feminist friends were saying. Um, and so, the, so that led me to, okay, now if there is, if so, if so much of the decision is in the choices that we make around family and children, uh, what exactly do men and women do that are, that are different in the workplace? So I began to research that. And there's not much out there on that. So I had to go into raw data. I had to um, f get findings, put piece, piece findings together from a lot of different places. Long story short, I found that there were actually 25 measurable differences between what men do in the workplace and what women do in the workplace. And all 25 of those differences lead to two things. They lead to men having more income and women having better lives. Once again, the women outsmarted us. Uh, the, uh, the women having better lives is not, it's usually better lives, but technically speaking, what it is is more balanced lives, lives that are more balanced between the home and work, lives that are more, fuf uh, more fuf fulfillment oriented on the job. So I began to sort of look at what some of those things were. So then I said, I thought it would be useful if I was able to actually measure the impact of those things. So for example, the average person, the average male and female, when you hear that men earn today the figure, the Census Bureau broad figure, is that men earn a dollar for each 80 cents that women um, earn in the workplace if it's full-time working women and full-time working men. So when I looked more carefully at that, I found that full-time working men uh, work four hours more in the workplace than full-time working women do. So then I started asking myself, well, what, what is the difference between what somebody makes who works four hours more in the workplace versus somebody who works four hours less? And I found that uh, somebody that works four hours more in the workplace 
earns 44% more in the workplace than somebody who works four hours less. So I began to start understanding that, and then if you work 10 hours more in the workplace, if you say you somebody who works 44 hours per week in the workplace earns on average 100% more than someone who works 34 hours per week in the workplace. Now understand they don't earn that much more on the same job, but the fact that they're willing to work longer gives them leverage to get different types of jobs, different types of promotions, work for different types of companies that lead to 100% more income. Now the implications of that were enormous, meaning that now when a couple got married and considered having children, and we unconsciously sort of moved into a sort of mode of, well, the, the man can earn more in the workplace, the woman is going to be a little bit more discriminated against, therefore let's go ahead and have the man take care of the work and women take care of the children. Now we realize that it's really, economically speaking, purely economically, it's fine to have one person stay home and the other person get involved with the, the, um, the workplace. And it could be either, but when we realize that the discrimination is not, a, is not really the issue, then we realize that, the, that, dis, that it could be the woman that's out in the workplace and the man that stays home. And then that dictates to us looking for different types of partners. I, I notice that when I go to parties and there's a single woman, that oftentimes the single woman is, is introduced by the host of the party to the doctor, to the lawyer, to the to the, you know, the, 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 um, the successful but not the not successful author, um, the, the, <laughs> um, th things like that. But she's seldom introduced at a party to, there's a guy over there, observe the way he's listening to that woman. Observe that he's asking her questions and not feeling a need to interrupt her. Observe that as he's listening to her, he's not just looking around to see if there's a more attractive woman that he's uh, there at the party. Observe that the woman he's listening to is not the most attractive woman at the party. There's a man you'd be interested in. There's a man who's likely to be secure enough to follow you from town to town, from city to city, to raise the children that has the nurturing skills to care about them. We don't socialize our daughters to then look for men like that, and then when those men don't reach out and, and go after her, to, for her to reach out and go after him. Because what we, one thing we do know is that people who have happier marriages are disproportionately more likely to be people for who got together as a result of the woman taking more than the ordinary amount of initiative. When a woman, in a sense, is happy, usually the couple is more likely to be happy. And so, they, um, so, so all that's just the implication from the time issue alone. The, t the time leads to disproportionately amounts, larger amounts of more money. But I was also beginning to see that each of those 25 ways um, to uh, differences between men and women were really 25 ways that women could receive higher pay should they choose to do so. But I also felt that it was my obligation to not just say, you should earn more money, female, because, many, because to earn more money is not necessarily to have a better life. You are listening to www.interlinker.org.